Today, we're going to be talking about confession. I'm starting a new series right now that's going to go for eight weeks. And the series is very simple. It is seven things to definitely do if you want to totally destroy your life. And we're going to try to stay away from those things. We're borrowing a list from the Catholics, the seven deadly sins. Uh, the seven deadly sins, that's not found in the Bible. It's not a list Jesus gave in one of his speeches. Um, it's just a good sort of an outline for us as we work through over the next eight weeks, seven things that we ought to look at and make sure that our life is not exposed or we're not vulnerable in or about. Um, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Today, we're starting the series by talking talking about confession and we're talking about having communion, which we will do in the second part of our teaching section. But right now, confession is something that's really important. Now, confession is not somebody you go to to uh, talk about a list of sins that you've done to receive um, you know, some sort of forgiveness from a man or through a process. Um, confession is something you do between you and the Lord where you in your heart, you tell the Lord, you tell God, listen, you've pointed this out to me. There's a thought, an action, an attitude in my life, displeasing to you, keeping me from who you want me to be. And I agree with you, God. I want to make it right. It's just a prayer from your mind to God. It's a thought you think to him. And he receives that thought. And the Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, and I think it'll be up here on the screen, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, there are a couple conditions here. The first one is if we confess. Now, the word if in the Greek often could be uh, substituted for the word since because it is the natural part of a believer's life. As a matter of fact, in 1 John, John uses this sort of as a, a, a checkpoint or a, uh, an affirmation that you're really a follower of Christ. A follower of Christ keeps a current account of sin in their life, makes sure that we're not harboring thoughts, actions, or attitudes displeasing to God and keeping us from being the people he wants us to be. Now, God is not an egomaniac who has a list of rules. And if you don't follow the rules, it makes him mad. And so he wants you to confess where you don't follow his rules so that you make him happy and that you can be, I mean, it's not about that. It's about God knowing who he created you to be, desiring to have a relationship with you and knowing that there are things that we do in our lives that keep us from having that right relationship, which breaks God's heart and keeps us from finding true happiness and joy, which is being able to live our lives for him. So in reality, the confession and the sin and the acknowledgement, all of this is for our benefit, for God's glory and for the good of the people who are around us. And so it's not really doing something for somebody else as much as it is doing something for us that benefits somebody else, that reconnects us to God. Now, you may ask a question. Well, if I'm already saved, if I'm already a Christian, why would I have to confess again? And if you ask that question, that would be a fair question. And so I want to give you a theology lesson. Now, I'm moving quick, as you can tell, um, because we only have like 15 to 20 minutes in this first section. And I want to give it to you so you understand. We have many people who are coming to Capital City Church in different ways, right? Some have been here a long time, which is fantastic. Some are transplants, moved from somewhere else. Great religious experience. You're here. We have many refugees from different denominations, different faith. We've gathered here. We have some survivors from bad experiences who come and are gathering here. And I love the fact that we are sort of a melting pot of people from different backgrounds, from different places with um, different faith stories. And it's a safe place to be. You are God's kind of people. And I love the fact that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. I don't have time to be theologically comprehensive and to tell you from the ground up everything that I'd love to tell you if we were having coffee together. But there's two types of being right with God, two ways to think about it. One is called imputed righteousness. Now that's a theological term you learn in first year of seminary, but all it means is that when you're saved, God looks at you the way or through Jesus that Jesus' sacrifice pays the price for our sin and his righteousness justifies us with God. So when we confess our sin, we've been made right with God. The Holy Spirit comes and indwells our life. That's another thing I'd love to talk to you about at length, but God comes and lives within us and we begin to live a different way. We go from old to new, from death to life, everything changes. However, just like in a marriage, you can be married 
but you can have things that are between you and your wife or your partner or friendship or whatever relationship you have. And if there are things that are not right between Joy and me, even though we're still married, our fellowship, our relationship isn't what it should be. We're not a team. Now, being a team with God doesn't mean he's, you know, next to us and, you know, we're equal. But it means that our relationship, that we're connected, that our friendship is intact, that our fellowship is enabled. And when we allow things to cloud that, then in a sense, we keep that relationship on hold and we don't move any further in our faith, which keeps us from our joy, which causes people around us not to experience what God's intended. And it's not living for God's glory. And so the reason it's important for us to keep a current account of sin, to examine our hearts, to confess the things that we have done and the ways that we failed God is because if we don't, it affects our relationship with him. It's not right. And just like I wouldn't expect my, my wife to overlook everything that I do without me knowing that I've wronged her and told her I'm sorry and ask her for forgiveness, even more so would I not ever want to look at God and just say, you know what, I don't care enough about you to ask forgiveness for what I've done. My relationship with you isn't important enough for me to consider that. It's unthinkable. And so from time to time, we as Christians, we go back and examine our hearts. We confess those things that God points out to us that are wrong and we start new. Now, if you don't think there's anything wrong in your heart, I'll give you three places that you can start. Number one, in 1 Peter 3, we hear that, um, I'll just talk about husbands to wives because many of us, some of us in here are married. If a husband's not treating his wife, according to 1 Peter 3, in a way that God expects that we're not uh, helping her in her walk with Christ, that we're not the person that she needs to be able to strengthen her faith, that God holds it against us and that our prayers are hindered. And as men, we've put a pause on our walk with God and we can't go any further. In Psalm 66, we're told that if we have sin in our heart that we know is there, but we kind of like it and we're just gonna leave it there, that it stops our relationship with God. It puts it on pause and keeps us from moving further in our faith. In Matthew, Jesus says that if we know that we have relationships that are broken, things that we haven't forgiven, stuff that's wrong between me and somebody else in my thoughts, in my heart, the way I've acted, to put down the sacrifice that we're going to offer at the church, at the temple, go make it right and come back because our relationship is on pause with God. So there's things that I've thought about. I've had a whole week to, to work on it before you. And even this morning I woke up and I'm like, man, God, you've revealed things in me that I need to confess. And I did. And one of them was that I'm just trying to control things in my life that I can't control. And I'm tired of arguing with God about them. And I realized that I kind of put my life on hold because I just kept wrestling with stuff that was above my pay grade. So I woke up this morning saying, all right, God, this, 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 and this. I laid five things out. I'm not going to tell you what they are because it's just between me and God. But I tell them five things. And I said, these are yours. These aren't mine. All of them. Can't do it anymore. They're yours. I confess. So I don't have that pause in my relationship with him anymore so that I can be free. You tracking with me? King David messed up royally. We've talked about this in oh, probably at least a half a dozen times, maybe more. David, at the height of his reign as the king of Israel, made some mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Um, when you're a king, the mistakes that you make are compounded. This particular mistake, um, this pattern in his life, I'll just tell you what it was. David was bad with women. And it wasn't that women are bad at all. It's that David was bad. I raised two boys and I told them, you are responsible for your actions regardless of what any woman does. You're a man, be a man, be a man of God. If I raised daughters, I'd tell them the same thing. You're responsible for your actions regardless of what any man does. But David, he had a problem with women. If he wanted a woman, he took the woman. It didn't matter who she was. And he passed it on to his son, Solomon, who turned it into a professional sport. I mean, he blew it up far more than David ever did. And there were consequences that went for generations after that. Many people believe that this sin, that this combination of sins began the fracture of a united Israel and caused generations of death, of separation, of exile, of captivity, of consequence. Our sin doesn't just affect us. As men, our sin doesn't just affect us. As women, your sin doesn't just affect you. The people who look to you, the people who count on you, the people in your circle, whether you have children, whether you're married, whether you have friends, whoever you come in contact with each day, 
we're either nudging toward the Lord or we're pulling away from the Lord. And our relationship with God is 100% of the reason. And so God takes it very seriously. Now, David, he was hanging out one time at a time he shouldn't have been hanging out. He was middle-aged. He was bored. He told his men to go off to war. He stayed home, looked out the window, saw a naked woman, should have looked away, didn't look away. She probably shouldn't have been naked where she was. Who knows? He called for her. She came. She got pregnant. Instead of confessing it, he had her husband killed, who was one of David's most loyal soldiers who had said, I will literally die for you and proved it over and over and over again on the battlefield. He talked about the ultimate in treachery, the ultimate in disloyalty. And not only that, but he acted like he was valiant. And he said, listen, you now are a widow because your husband has died in battle, even though David caused the death. So someone should marry you and take care of you. So he married her out of the goodness of his heart. It was a sham. It was a mockery and everybody knew it, but he was king and he did what he wanted. So the Bible says, and by the way, you can find this story in 2 Samuel 11. That's in the Old Testament, about halfway through, give or take, not exactly. And at the end of 2 Samuel 11, there's some words there that are really important. And the words are sort of ominous and sort of foreshadowing. And it just simply says something like this. And what David did greatly displeased the Lord. So a period of time went by and David was sick because of his sin. He knew he had done something and compounded it and compounded it. And it's not really about the sin because people sin and sometimes we make big mistakes and we don't point out one sin and say, you're a worse sinner than somebody else. All of us sin and David's sins were compounded, unforgiven because they were unconfessed. And it literally made him sick where he says that he felt that his life was ebbing away. So finally he comes face to face with God and he said, I am done hiding, I'm done running, I'm gonna own it. You wanna know one of the things that you can totally do to definitely destroy your life? Don't own your own sin and your own actions. Blame Satan like Eve did, blame the woman like Adam did. Blame your parents and the way they raised you. Blame the church you grew up in. Blame a pastor who made you mad one day. Blame your environment, blame your boss. David finally got done blaming and just said to God, look, it's just me and you and I've got to make this right because I am so tired of being separated from my right relationship with you. And he talked about some things in Psalm 51. And Psalm 51 is David's prayer of confession. Now I encourage you to read Psalm 51. You can download the NIV Bible app. If you have an iPhone, you can do it for free. Android, I don't have any idea what they do. They probably have something similar. Uh, but um, BibleGateway.com, if you don't have a Bible, BibleGateway.com, you can pick any translation you like. I teach you out of the NIV translation because it's one of the more common translations that people have. But I encourage you to read all of Psalm 51 because it is a psalm about David's prayer of confession to God and then his prayer for the people after he confessed. But he says some things as he's gearing up toward the section we're going to cover today. And he said one thing that was really interesting. And he says this in verse six, and it's not in your notes, it's just bonus. He says, um, God, you desire truth from us. Just own it and tell the truth to God to stop playing games. It was me. I did it. About two weeks ago, I went to a concert with Pastor Dan and Lori, a couple other friends from church right over there. And we were at the Johnston, I think it was City Hall. And we were on the grass, you know, out there in Johnston and listening to an 80s tribute band. Now, Pastor Dan and I, we're old and um, we were reminiscing big time. I mean, Def Leppard, you know, and we're like, remember high school? And we were talking about, I'm telling all the stories that weren't true about me in athletics. Dan's telling all the ones that were true about him in athletics. We were reminiscing and, you know, songs remind you of stuff, you know, and, you know, I'll, we'd stop our conversation and yell 5309 every once in a while because 867, you know, you finish that. Does nobody know that song, 867? Oh. I am old. Do you know how many years ago 1980 was? I mean, that's like 45 years ago. Isn't that crazy? 44 years ago. Um, but that's still the best decade ever in the history of decades. So we're sitting out there on the lawn 
in a semicircle. Music loud. That's the way you like it when you're at an 80s tribute concert. Um, but we're trying to talk, right? And so every once in a while, we would get up and walk over to the chair of whoever else was there and, you know, kind of squat down and we would talk to each other because we're, you know, Dan and I can hardly hear anyway half the time uh, as you get older. So we're yelling at each other over the music. Now, a nice couple came in in front of us. They looked like they were a nice couple. They had two bulldogs. They came in and they sat very close to us in front of us with their bulldogs. And um, I like dogs. I'm a dog person. I mean, dogs are great. Bulldogs, however, um, well, they have some genetic predispositions. And I'll just tell you what they are in case you don't know. They are gassy. Bulldogs are gassy. And there were two little French bulldogs and they came and sat down right in front of us, nose toward the stage. <laughs> And all of a sudden, and Joy and I were closest to him, my eyes started burning and I smelled something terrible. And, and at first I looked at Joy and she's like, what? And then, you know, she looked back at me and, and we realized it was the dogs because every once in a while they would stand up and then they would sit down and we're like, man, this is bad. We couldn't move anywhere. It just wouldn't stop. And so Dan, you know, he's sitting next to me and finally Dan, he looks over at me and he goes, hey. And I said, what? He goes, that's not me. And I said, Dan. If that's you, I'm taking you to urgent care because that's bad. And, and everyone who came over said the same thing. That's not me. That's not me. Now, it wasn't them. But had it been, you own it. And that's what David's saying. Own your sin. And sometimes we just love to say, it's not me. It's not my fault. Now, the second thing that David said, and this is found again between verse 6 and verse 10 where we're going to start is he said, the bones that you have broken in me, I appreciate. Now that's a paraphrase. But when you read it, he uses words like hyssop, which was a branch that was used to celebrate or to sprinkle blood that, that sort of represented the Passover or atonement for sins and was used symbolically through the Old Testament. And he says, for the bones that you broke, I'm grateful. A shepherd would break the leg of a lamb when lamb kept disobeying a baby or an adult. And it looked cruel at first because he would break the leg of a, of a wandering sheep. But he would set the bone and put the sheep on his shoulders and he would carry that sheep until the leg healed. And the sheep learned to love the shepherd because the shepherd carried the sheep when the sheep couldn't walk. And that when the bone healed, the sheep was able to walk and the sheep followed the shepherd because the sheep had learned to love the shepherd. And so David said, thank you for the wounds that you've given me for the fact that I can't sweep my sin under the rug, for the fact that I can't live with the ways that I've wronged you. And then he goes in in verse 10 to a couple things we're gonna talk about. We're not gonna spend much time on any of these things because um, we don't have it, but I wish we could. And David, right off the bat, he says to God, create in me a clean heart, create in me a pure heart, O Lord. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Now, David was not blaming anybody else. He was not demanding that God forgive him. He was appealing to God's grace and he was throwing himself at God's mercy and his confession proves a couple of things or teaches a couple of things. So let's look through this brief list. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, then God will. So the opposite of this is if you don't want these things in your life, then don't confess your sin. He'll unburden your heart. And the language that's used here is not God help me start over to a point or go back to a point where I was in sixth grade when my relationship with you was right or help me feel like that day I went on the mission trip when I was in high school, or take me back to 15 years ago when I was in this church at this place, or I wanna go, it was not about going back to a better time spiritually. It was about a do-over, a fresh start. It was about a reset button. It was about a mulligan if you play golf. It was creating me a new heart. Let me start from scratch with you and move forward into a new relationship because back can never be recreated. It's something we worship but can never actually accomplish. We remember better than it was, but our circumstances in life have changed. And so he's saying, take me forward with an unburdened heart. Let's start today, God. 
Too good to be true if it were me and you, but not too good to be true between you and God. And then he says, renew a steadfast spirit within me. Then God will unburden our heart and he will steady our spirit. When we have unconfessed sin in our life, James talks about the person who wavers, a double-minded person. He says, it's like a ship in a sea, in the middle of a storm, without a rudder or a sail, that your life is blown by circumstance, by emotion, by chance, by poor decisions, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And all we do is collide into the sides. Have you ever felt like that about your life? Like you can't get out of your own way that there's something wrong and you can't pinpoint it. And David is saying, he experienced it. Steady my spirit, renew this spirit within me. And then he says in the next two sections, something that is particular to the Old Testament, but relevant to us in the New Testament. He says, don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, the easy part of this application is, is that when we sin and there are things between God and me, even though God is always present in my life, I don't sense it. My glasses are dirty, so I can't see it. My feeler is defiled, so I can't feel it. But then when he says, well, the part about the Holy Spirit, when he says, don't take your Holy Spirit from me, in the Old Testament time, before Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection, I'm giving you a lot, so I'm trusting that you're listening, the Holy Spirit didn't indwell people, didn't live within believers. That happened at Pentecost in the book of Acts. But the Holy Spirit would come upon somebody for a period of time in the Old Testament, prophets. The Holy Spirit of God would sort of anoint them, would sort of be upon them and with them. Kings, certain kings. When Samuel anointed David, it was symbolic of God's presence on David, leading David. God took his presence away from King Saul, David's predecessor, because of Saul's sin, culminating with him consorting with a sorceress and worshiping demons. The next day, dying in a tragic and unimaginable way. And David is saying, God, do not take your calling from my life. Don't abandon the purpose that you have created me for. Don't give up on me, even though I gave up on you. And he was asking God, not telling God. He didn't say, God, do you know how much I have to offer you? Do you know what kind of man I am? Do you know who I know? Do you know how much? He was throwing himself at the mercy of God, saying, I'm broken, I'm humble, and I'm owning it. Sensing the Holy Spirit is being able to have that check in our heart and our knower when something's wrong, when we are tempted to do something wrong, that gentle nudge to move a direction or make a decision, the words that God gives when we have a conversation, the desire to forgive when somebody offends, it's that subtle nudge gentle relationship. David didn't want it gone. He wanted it back. All right, just a couple more. He says, restore to me the joy of salvation. We are in a war against joy and Christians were giving it away. The joy of our salvation comes because God is in control. We all believe that. God is good. We all believe that. He has a plan for our life. I hope we all believe that. This world, this country, what's going on, what we see on the news, what we experience every day, if we're so pessimistic, if we're so angry, if we're so afraid that all we can do is curse the darkness and predict God's wrath and his judgment on everybody and walk around with our heads down, not being able to wait for it to happen because all of them need to get what they deserve, we have given up our joy of our salvation because of the sin in our heart because we serve a God who is optimistic, who's in control, and though even though 
Things are bad right now in some ways. Things are still really good in the ways that count. But we give it up because all of a sudden our faith falls short and we think God needs our help. So we'll fight a good battle. We even call it a Christian battle, but we fight with the devil's ways and we expect God to bless us. And our joy goes out the window and it's replaced with fear and bitterness and cynicism. Now that's us. David had his own set of circumstances, but he's saying, restore to me the joy of salvation. Some of us have lost our joy. Renew right desires in me by granting me a willing spirit. I think of this as the battle for my wanter. I'm out of time. Sometimes I want to do what's right. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I want to want it. Sometimes I know that I should want to want to want it, but I just don't want it. So sometimes I pray for my wanter and say, God, my wanter's broken. And if my wanter's broken, if it's off course, it's because something in here is wrong and I need to confess so that God restores. And then finally, creating me a willing spirit to sustain me. When we confess our sin, the word sustain here does not mean barely get by. The word sustain means thrive. Give me a willing spirit to thrive in the world around me spiritually in things that matter to God through relationship, the gospel, hope, meaning, and ultimately our destiny in heaven. And if you think you're doing pretty well, the Apostle Paul gives us a warning because even after me teaching, maybe you have managed to skirt most of these things and still feel pretty good, which is great. This is what the Apostle Paul says to us. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful because pride goes before a fall. Actually, he didn't say it quite that way, but that's what he means. Be careful that you don't fall. Now, in just a few minutes, we'll come back and we'll talk a little more about confession you know, memory is a funny thing and we all remember things in different ways. And after the first service, I had somebody come up to me and say, you know, um, Def Leppard, you know, they don't, they don't sing that song about Jenny. And I said, I know that. That's Tommy Two-Tone. And, and I said, I remember very, very well. I was using it separately in, you know, two different recollections and instances. It was an 80s tribute band, but sometimes we don't remember. We always remember things the way we want to remember them. I, a couple of days ago, Joy and I, well, she was getting ready in the morning. And sometimes, sometimes it takes her a little longer than me. Not always, sometimes. And she was frustrated. I think it might've been her hair. I don't know. And um, she said something like, oh, I just, you know, can't get it right, you know, and looks great to me. And so I was trying to be optimistic. And I said, well, sweetheart, I said, you got something going for you. You've been in the same relationship with the same man for 35 years. And I said, and it's me. And um, yeah, I know. Uh, it's kind of like having a Jack Russell for a husband. You never forget you got a husband. Uh, she, I'm trying to be less needy, less clingy. Um, but she kind of rolled her eyes and she was like, great. And she goes, wait a second. She goes, we haven't been together for 35 years. We've been together for 25 years. And now I panicked because um, Joy is like always right. And I don't mean like, oh, you make your wife happy by saying she's right. I mean, she's always right. When she, when she corrects me about something like that, it's like 99.9% .9 of the time, she's right. And so I usually just immediately defer and go, well, of course, sweetheart, how in the world would I think we had 10 extra years? But then I stopped in a moment of clarity. Maybe it was spirit led, who knows? And I said, Richard is 29, our son, remember him? And we were married five years before you had him. So by my math, that means we were married almost 35 years ago in December, and we've been together 36 years, not 35. So instead of saying she was wrong, what she said is, I'm not that old. <laughs> or you go from there. You don't go anywhere from there. No, sweetheart, you're not that old, but we have a 29-year-old son and another 26-year-old son, and we like them both really well. Sometimes we just remember things differently because we want to. The older we get, the more we remember things the way we want them to be or wish they had been and not the way they really were. Same thing is true with our lives and with our sin. Regret can be a powerful motivator or it can be a paralyzer. 
And you can allow yourself to be motivated by the mistakes that you've made. And that motivation looks at least, well, like this in two ways. One, you remember the pain for whatever you did and the, the consequences and you allow it to drive you not to make the same mistakes again. And you also use it as an opportunity to help people who are in your life, maybe coming behind you, maybe people who listen to you or look to you to not make the same mistakes again. And it takes humility, but that's part of confession. To want the people around you to be better than you are in every single way. Which means that sometimes we're honest and sometimes we're vulnerable and sometimes we're transparent, but it's for their good and not for ours. Well, maybe it's for both. The Apostle Paul reinforced this point as he gave instructions to a church in Corinth that made a joke of the Lord's Supper of communion. But this church had a problem because the in crowd were throwing the party at six, let's say. Show up at my house, we're gonna have communion and a dinner. And they would only invite their friends, the ones they liked, the small circle. And the rest of the church, they'd say, hey, show up at 7.15. So the rest of the church would show up at 7.15 after the party was over, the good food was gone, the wine had been drunk, feeling like outcasts and like they didn't belong. And nothing could represent the body of Christ in a worse way than behaving like that because the ground is level at the foot of the cross and everybody is welcome. And so Paul was saying, listen, you've got to hit a reset button because you are slapping Jesus in the face with the way that you're participating, you're practicing the Lord's Supper. It's supposed to be a time when we come and we recommit our lives, where we reaffirm our brokenness and dependence, where we confess our sin. And so he gave some instructions to the church because with every criticism or critique always came positive instruction. And this was a church that was pretty extreme. So we can learn from them. In 1 Corinthians the Apostle Paul says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. Now that's the last supper. It's the time when Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room, gathered them together. And it was the final real events before he was arrested, before he was tried, before he was tortured, before he was crucified and before he rose again. So this is what Paul had received from the Lord. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, that's that sounds kind of hard to understand, but this is what it means. When we celebrate communion together, when we drink from the cup and eat the cracker, symbolically representing Jesus' body and his blood, we're saying something to him and we're saying something to each other. What I'm saying to Jesus is, as best I can make it, everything is right between you and me. The Apostle Paul goes on and talks about this in the next section. But it's also saying to the people around us, when you see me standing here, and I went first last service, not because I'm better, because I had a head start. When you see me standing here, I see you standing here. It means that as best we're able, we've made things right between God and me and you. That you haven't held anything back that you are back in the same spiritual state that you were when you became a believer in the first place. It's like renewing your vows. Nothing held back. No fine print in the contract. Nothing squirreled away in the heart. And the Apostle Paul goes on to expound on this a little bit. He says, so whoever eats or eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, in other words, making a mockery of it, kind of hiding, being deceptive, duplicitous, in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. The way you examine yourself is you present yourself to God. You don't have to come up to the altar and steps and throw yourself out in some kind of crazy way. It's just you getting alone with God and your thoughts going, here I am, honest, vulnerable, just the two of us. Shut your eyes if you want. Don't shut your eyes if you want. You present yourself 
to God. And you say, take that flashlight of your Holy Spirit and you look at every part of my life. If there are any thoughts, any actions, any attitudes lurking within me that need to go, you point them out. And then when he points them out, which I think he will, you confess them. I agree with you, God, they need to go. I am rejecting these things, God. Give me the strength to live a different way. And the Apostle Paul says, when we do this, we have to go through this process because we don't want to make a mockery of it. We want to come back the way we came in the first place. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ and eat and drink, they bring judgment on themselves. So this is what's going to happen. Brian's going to come out and he's going to sing a song. And it's a song for you to reflect for you to present yourself to God, for you to ask God that question. Point it out, Lord. And if it's there, I'm going to confess it to you. And you got to be brave because if you ask God, I don't know that I've ever asked God and walked away going, man, I'm doing really, really good. There's always something, always. If I came away saying I'm doing really good, that would be the thing right there. I would need to confess that sin of pride, always something. And then after you confess, you say, thank you, God. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for my church family. You come and you celebrate because after all, that's what it is. So Brian's gonna sing. So I just want you to sit, to read the scripture on the screen if you want to, to meet with God. one more time before we dismiss. Father, thank you for what we have experienced already. And I thank you for your church, Father. I thank you for those who've been around a while, for those who are transplanted, who you've led here, for those who have found refuge here, and for those who maybe have survived other bad experiences in the past and are trying to rebuild and figure out how to make sense of faith. Thank you for the body of Christ, that the ground is level at the foot of the cross, that everyone's important, that everyone, everyone, all of us are your kind of people. I thank you for your love and that you love us so much, that you accept us just the way we are, but that you love us so much that you will not leave us that way. And that you promise us that if we continue to lean in and allow you, you will transform us and change us into new people by changing the way we think and react and act in this world. And I thank you for the journey that we are on together, for the fall that we are entering together, and for the expectation of great things that you have in store for your glory and yours alone. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.